Okay, is that too much light in the background? Is that light bothering you? Let me know, guys. Is that light bothering you? Before I move on, is that light okay? Is it bothering you? If not, I'll just, we'll stay here. Anybody? Okay, I guess nobody's on. All right. Okay, what's up? Hey, guys, welcome. We'll wait a few more minutes. As you wait, let me just pray then. <clears throat> and I'll give you a link to Mark Driscoll's sermon on forgiveness. Powerful sermon. It was a powerful sermon. Right? But let me just pray. <clears throat> Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus, the Father's beloved Son. We love you, Holy Spirit. You are the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son. Bless this session, Father, for your glory. Fill us with your Spirit. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your love. Well, cover us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask that you give us the grace to know you more intimately, to love you more perfectly, and to obey you from the depth of our heart by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father. And have mercy on us and forgive us for our shortcomings and our failures, for our struggles, our, our carnal desires. Crucify our flesh and fill us with life from the Spirit, power from the Spirit, fruit from the Spirit, Father. And surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. And Father, I ask you to surround our loved ones, my daughters, with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. In the almighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, cover us with the blood of Jesus, Father. Wash us in the blood of your Son. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And our loved ones, my daughters, wash them. Purify them, cleanse them, Father. Cleanse us, cleanse them, Father. In the blood of Jesus, the beloved, we love you, Father. We love the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. And Father, please fill me with wisdom and knowledge and insight, understanding from your Spirit. By the power of your Holy Spirit, enable me to recall the passages and interrupt them, inter interpret them correctly, perfectly. Loosen my tongue and save me from stammering, Father. In the almighty name of the Lord Jesus, we ask this favor, Father. Please save me from error, confusion, stammering to recall scripture perfectly, interpret it perfectly in the power of the Holy Spirit, to bless your people, Father. Bless your people who are listening. Bless them with wisdom and knowledge and power from your Holy Spirit that we can understand your word, love your word, live your word, proclaim your word, and even die for your word, the Holy Scriptures that you have preserved, your voice to us. Save us from attacks on the enemy, Father, and give us the health we need to glorify you and the holiness we need to delight your heart. We need you, Father. I need you, Abba. Baba, we need you. My daughters need you. Our loved ones need you. We need your son, the Lord Jesus, and the victory that he wrought for us on the cross of Calvary by his blood shed on the cross. And we need your Holy Spirit. Please bless this session, Father. Please, Lord, I need you. And help me to live your word perfectly, all of us, not just to be hearers but doers of your word. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And help us to love one another and to love those in need by our deeds, not just our lips. In Jesus' name we pray. All right. Welcome. This is Nino Short Notice. I said I wouldn't be back online, God willing, till Sunday, but I have some free time now. I have free time. I have about two hours, God willing. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to respond because we had someone in the comment section. I guess people don't understand. Let me share this. And again, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to protect me from error. And the Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus, empower me to recall passages correctly, not to forget. Destroy my forgetfulness and grant us the gifts of faithfulness, holiness, righteousness, purity, and love and devotion to our Lord Jesus. Because we depend on the Holy Spirit. But let me share this again. I don't know if I want to mention names because one thing I've said, I don't want to turn my YouTube channel into a bashing session. Pray for me. Can you pray and ask the Lord Jesus to save me from that, to constrain me from that? I don't want to turn my YouTube channel into a bashing session where I mention people and attack them because that's what, again, I'm going to mention him by name. James White does on the dividing line, and I hate that, so I don't want to become the thing I hate and become a hypocrite. Right. So can you pray for that? So I'm not going to mention the gentleman's name, but let me just say this again. I've said it. I'm going to repeat it again. You don't have to agree with me because I know there are different viewpoints concerning some of these topics. We can agree to disagree. But one thing I don't want you to do. OK, here's one thing I don't want you to do. Don't come to my comment section telling me you disagree and trying to correct me. 
because then I sense arrogance. To me, that means you're quite arrogant. You're proudful, either because you want to impress me with your knowledge or correct me in front of others to show I'm wrong. Don't do that. Well, first and last, keep praying in Jesus' almighty name. I tighten my diet by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today's a cheat day, so I've been cheating. But in Jesus' name, tighten my diet. Lose this weight and get my health back and to be holy unto the Lord Jesus and plant me here for his glory and ask the Lord to confirm something in my heart concerning a godly partner. Ask God to make it really clear so I don't wait. If it's not the one, just move on, right? With me there? Yeah. So just, just keep praying for me. But coming back to the issue, here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. You can disagree with me. That's fine. I don't want you to blindly follow anything, everything I say. I want you to take what I say, pray over it, study it, and if you see I'm wrong, or if you hear another viewpoint that you agree with, that's fine. If I think I'm wrong on something, my prayer is the Holy Spirit will convict me to then change my position. But obviously, if I'm sharing a position, that means I'm convinced of that position. To then debate me, you're not going to convince me. You're going to cause you and I to stumble, because it's going to get into a heated match and we're going to end up attacking each other. And we don't want to do that because that's not fruitful. That doesn't please the Lord Jesus, right? Right? That's not pleasing to the Lord Jesus, right? You with me there? I just want to make sure you guys are hearing. So do me a favor. You disagree with me? Praise God. I don't want you to blindly follow me. We all blindly follow the triune God. We only trust the Holy Spirit perfectly. And we pray that when we are mistaken, the Spirit will convict us of that error and turn from it. And if we think someone else is an error, let's ask the Spirit to show him or her that they're mistaken or maybe you're mistaken. But don't come to the comment section challenging me to say you disagree with me because then I'm going to take it as you're trying to impress me with your knowledge. And don't impress me. I'm a nobody. Honestly, I'm being honest. Don't impress me. I'm nobody. Or you're trying to... Challenge me to show others that I'm wrong. Don't do that. Stay away from my comment section. Don't do that. And because of these two passages were brought up, the gentleman thought I was unaware of First Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 to 14, specifically 9 to 15, and 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, because he raised those passages to refute my claim that Titus, uh, sorry, 1 Timothy 3.11 says that there can be female deacons. Can you believe that? Even though I gave the exegesis in the context, and then I gave extra biblical historical evidence. Do you guys remember last night's session? We even had a pagan governor uh, in Turkey, Bithynia, which is in Turkey, writing to the emperor in 112 AD. We even have extra biblical testimony from a governor who was persecuting Christians, torturing Christians for leaving the worship of the gods and goddesses and refusing to have, offer sacrifice to them to worship Jesus. And he says that he tortured two female slaves who were deaconesses. Right? So with that said, we're going to discuss those passages, but I'm going to maybe have to do one, more than one session because... See, reading the Bible on a surface level does a disservice to every one of us. Now, again, for the record, I don't know everything, obviously. I'm human. I'm imperfect. I learn from other godly men and women, and I learn from sermons like today. I learned a lot from Mark Driscoll, who had a fantastic, phenomenal sermon on forgiveness. And I'll give you the link. I'm glad he says that, Vine, because... Uh, <laughs> Because over the years, as I have studied the Bible with greater depth, and I pray that that's by the grace of the Holy Spirit, and listen to various viewpoints, I can no longer say I'm a five-point Calvinist. And I don't st strictly stick, stick to doctrines that are necessarily Protestant. My position is this, Vine. I want to be a Biblicist. I know everyone does. My prayer to the Holy Spirit is, please, Holy Spirit, Possess me fully, complete me, own me, own everything I own for the glory of Jesus, own my daughters, own everything, and correct me when I'm wrong, and save me from sin, and give me the power to live in a manner to like the heart of Jesus. That's my prayer. Now, obviously, that's something the Holy Spirit does in us and through us over a period of time, right? 
where he sanctifies us daily to become more like Jesus, right? So whatever I am convinced of scripturally, I'll accept. Whatever I don't see in scripture, I'll reject. And that means if there is a particular doctrine that's unique to Catholicism vine or orthodoxy, but I see ample evidence in scripture, I'll accept it. But it doesn't mean I'm going to become Orthodox or Roman Catholic. Even yesterday, we had a gentleman who made the mistake, Adam Kadmon, who's a Catholic, tell me, why aren't you Catholic? And because of that, I had to really express my honest viewpoint about how corrupt the Pope is and why I could never submit to the papacy. And I said, this is why I don't want you to ask me questions, because I don't want Catholics to think I'm bashing them and saying that no one in the Catholic Church is saved. I'm going to repeat again. This is my position. You don't have to agree with me. And if I'm wrong, Holy Spirit save me for the glory of Christ. I believe there are true born-again believers in every major historic branch of Christianity. And when I say branch of Christianity, I'm talking about Trinitarian churches. That would include Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, the Coptic Church, my own, <clears throat> the, the church of my own ancestors, the Nestorian Church, the Church of the East, right? But... The reason why I'm not Catholic is because I see there's a lot of false teachings, a lot of wrong teachings in the Catholic Church. Right? I cannot submit to the Pope as a vicar of Christ. I can't. It's not because I want to be stubborn. I just don't see it scripturally or historically. And when I see the mess that's the papacy, because you see what's happening to Roman Catholics. They are shocked, disheartened, heartbroken, even livid about the statements and the things this current Pope is doing. Right? Nope, there aren't female priests or bishops in the Bible, Gerard. Please, brother, don't chime in when it's too late. Yesterday I did a session where I answered the question. And let me repeat what I want you to do, Gerard. Go listen to the yesterday session. I said, as far as the Old and New Testaments are concerned, you'll find women assuming every major role. You'll find women prophets, prophetesses. Women deacons, deaconesses, and even an example of a female apostle, Junia, Romans 16, 7, an apostle prominent among the apostles. That means she was a prominent apostle, though some try to explain the Greek as saying, no, that the apostles consider it to be very prominent, which is stretching things because the clear exegesis and the historical interpretation is that Junia was a female apostle because you have apostles other than the 12 Sent out by the Holy Spirit, sent out by the church. See, because people get confused. Think about it this way. People get confused and think when you say apostle, you're talking about the 12, which is true. But are you aware others are called apostles who are not the 12? Did you know that? Did you know that even Barnabas was called an apostle and he wasn't an eyewitness to the historical Jesus? Barnabas wasn't with Jesus when Jesus was on earth. But are you aware of that? Guys, let's not get into attacks and attack the Pope and all that. I was just mentioning it in response to Vine. But are you aware that you have others besides the 12 called the apostles? And obviously, most definitely, everyone knows Paul. He wasn't part of the 12 because he didn't follow Jesus when Jesus was on earth. But Jesus commissioned him from heaven when he appeared to him in glory. So we could call him the 13th apostle. But besides even Paul and the 12, others are called apostles like... Barnabas, for example, Acts 14, 14. Exactly, Vine. Let me re repeat what Vine said. Too many arrogant Protestants following traditions of men too. 100% on the money. So listen, let me just try to be upfront because you mentioned James White again. People are going to say, oh, you can't stop talking about him. I'm trying in my heart to be as gracious and considered compassionate towards his brother. I really do. You know, he's a brother in Christ. He was one of the influences in my life early on in my journey. But the path that he's taken, the attitude he's shown, he's shown towards Christians, fellow Christians, and the way he expresses himself, it makes it very hard for me to respect him and not dislike him strongly. So I pray, Holy Spirit, heal my heart, not to be like him, but to love him and pray for his restoration. I hope he does. I don't know if he does, right? Because, Tony, I just watched his recent debates with Muslims, Tony Teb, and I just watched his sessions on Islam in Australia, and I just watched his talk on Roman Catholicism. Tony, can I be honest? It's very hard for me to listen to this man. 
it was becoming hard even before, but hearing these sessions became harder because he doesn't see clearly. He misrepresents why people attack him, right? And even then attacks them, right? Ungraciously makes them look like bubbling idiots, right? Like fanatics who are irrational, unchristlike. when that's the farthest thing from the truth. And so when I watch those things and then the way he explains reaching Muslims, as if others in the field don't love Muslims, don't want to have relationships with Muslims, but want to demonize Muslims. And it becomes very hard for me not to strongly dislike him and get angry with him. So I ask Holy Spirit, cover me with the blood of Jesus, set me free to forgive this brother and love him because it is your work to convict him. But it's very hard. Okay, very hard, especially the recent debates I watch. Right, the recent debates. I just I just watched Tony his debates with the Muslims. If I tell you, Tony, if I say this here on my live stream, and if I say that the, he did such a disheartening, disappointing job, you're going to say, "Oh, you're jealous, brother." So you just dislike him, and you're letting your hatred of of him just cloud your better judgment. See, that's why I was going to say something before, and I said, "Man, let me just shut up." But you mentioned it. Honestly, Tony, I can be honest with you. James White, honestly, by the grace of God, needs to be humble enough to realize either stop debating Muslims or stop debating, debating them on these topics, like the textual transmission of the New Testament and the Quran, or his debate with Abdullah Kunda on whether the Apostle Paul was a true apostle of Christ. Or did he hijack Christianity? That's all I can say. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. And you know what's sad, Tony? Because many Christians who follow him don't have great depth of knowledge concerning Islam or even these topics related to Christianity. They're going to be impressed by his performance and presentation. All the while, we who are in the field see that the Muslims are laughing. And that's why they love to use him and love to debate him. Right? Zina, you want the honest answer why I can't get Muslims to debate me? You're going to see it's arrogant. Then ask around. Ask David Wood. Ask Jay Smith, Christian Prince. Ask them so you don't see I'm boasting. Muslims are afraid of me. So what they use is my attitude towards them my attitude towards them because Muslims realize I'll go for the juggler. I'll embarrass them. I'll humiliate them. I will even insult and belittle their prophet if they insult and blaspheme my Lord or my scriptures. And so they use my quote unquote nasty attitude to say, see, he's too nasty, but that's a lie from hell because the very people say I'm nasty. They are some of the nastiest, most vicious blasphemers you can meet. Right? They don't believe me. What do you do with Muhammad Hijab and the way he treated David Wood? No, Christian Prince is phenomenal. Right? You with me there? The honest truth is they fear me because they know by the power of the Holy Spirit, not only will I destroy their objection, that's because of the power of the Holy Spirit, then I turn the objection against them. One of my... MO, like modus of operation, modus operandi. One of my <clears throat> strong points by the grace of God, because everything good is from the Holy Spirit. I don't just respond to the objection. I turn it against them. For example, I'll give you an example. Yeah, exactly. Dale Tuggy knows I'll decimate him. He's another foul, wicked, filthy, repulsive dog. See, and they don't like it. I call them what it is. I'll give you an example of turning an argument against the Muslim. I'll just give you one. We're going, go, we're going to go into the topic. All right, Matthew 26, 39. Yes, Rachel, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I do. Matthew 26, 39. Yes, let me, let me show you this passage and how I turn it against the Muslims. Let me tell you how someone like James White would respond, someone like me, how I would respond. And glory to God, glory to the triune God. David Wood responds the same way because we're partners and we sharpen each other. David Wood uses the same approach as does Anthony Rogers because we're teammates, we sharpen one another. Now watch, Matthew 26, 39. Watch here. Okay, watch here. 
And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You're going to hear Adnan Rashid and other Muslims say, See, Jesus prayed like Muslims. We Muslims pray like Jesus. He fell on his face to the ground. You Christians don't pray like that. Okay, so someone like James White will say, Well, what do you expect Jesus the God man to do? Do you expect him to be an atheist? Of course, Jesus, who became the perfect man, would then worship God because that's what the perfect man does. Do you expect him to be an atheist? You hear me there? That's response, right? Now, let me show you how I would respond. Are you ready now for my response? Are you ready for my response? I'll say, okay, so you agree Jesus prayed this prayer in Matthew 26, 39, right? They'll say yes. I go, okay, because you just quoted it. You can't tell me now this is not a, the prayer of the historical Jesus. You can't tell me it's wrong. So you, 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 you got to know you're stuck with it. And he's got to say yes if he's not going to be a liar. I say, okay, then guess what? You just proved Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist, and your God Allah is a false God. Do you know how you prove that? Because notice the one that Jesus prays to. Jesus prays to God as his father. He says, oh, my father. But according to your Quran, Allah is not the father of Jesus. He's not the father of anyone. No Muslim can say to Allah, you are my father, not even your prophet. So this prayer condemns Muhammad as an antichrist, an agent of Satan, and that your God is a false God. Thank you. You see how I do it? That's how I do it. And I do it with every passage they quote. In fact, if you don't believe me, Go listen to some of my debates or my rebuttals and my written rebuttals or my sessions when I'm responding to objections. This is what I need you to do. Explore my YouTube channel. I have material from two years ago addressing Adnan Rashid, Zakir Hussein, Ahmad Didat, Zakir Naik, Shabri Ali. Go listen to those sessions because I want more viewers and more likes, right? Anyway, you're going to see that's what I do. I don't just answer. I take the objection, turn it against them, then answer you get my point? That's how you need to train yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit to deal with Muslims. Let me give you another example. Can I give you another example? When they try to prove Muhammad is a prophet like Moses. Are you ready? Okay. The prophet like Moses. Write down Deuteronomy 18. We're not going to quote it. Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 19. Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 19. Okay. Okay. God is going to raise up a prophet like Moses from their brethren, and he's going to put his words in their mouth. So I'll say, okay, hold on. So you're quoting Deuteronomy to prove Muhammad is a prophet like Moses. Okay. Well, the prophet like Moses must teach the same things that Moses taught, and his theology must be the same as Moses' theology. Because you can't have a prophet like Moses who contradicts, who contradicts. The theology of Moses, right? Now, since you quoted Deuteronomy, you're stuck with it. Because let's go to Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. Now, watch how I turn it against them. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. Protestant is getting excited. He anticipated that I was going to go to Deuteronomy 34. Nobody in your face. I'm going to Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. Ye are the children of Jehovah your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. Wait, 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 wait. The God of Moses says, the Israelites are my children, my sons and daughters spiritually. Because the God of Moses is a spiritual being. He only has spiritual children. He's not a biological being to sire children sexually. But according to chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, when the Jews and Christians told Muhammad, we are the sons of Allah, his beloved, Muhammad's response is, say, why then does he chasten you for your sins? No, you are nothing but mortals that he created. So the God of Muhammad says he's not the father of the Jews. He's not the father of the Christians. He's not the father of Muhammad. He's not the father of everyone. But the God of Moses is, is the father of Israel. So how can Moses and Muhammad be prophets sent by the same God? How can Muhammad be a prophet like Moses? And this is the same book from the same book you quoted. But it's going to get worse for you. Deuteronomy 32 verse 6. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6.
Sorry about that. Do you thus requite, O Jehovah, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Not according to Allah and Muhammad. Hath he not made thee and established thee? Not according to Allah or Muhammad. Then look at Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20. Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20. Of the rock that begat thee, wait, 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 God begat Israel, gave birth to Israel. The rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when Jehovah saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Wait, he begat, gave birth to Israel to be his sons and daughters, though that begetting is spiritual, not physical. Because... The Israelites knew that God is a spiritual being. He doesn't have sex. He doesn't have a consort. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. So, folks, can I ask you a question? Since the God of Moses in Deuteronomy says, the Israelites are sons and daughters. He begat them. He bore them spiritually to be you know, their father and for them to be his children. How then can Moses be the prophet like, Mo, um, I'm sorry, Mo, Muhammad, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue, be the prophet like Moses when Muhammad's God says he's not the father of anyone, he's not the father of Jews, he's not the father of Jesus, the highest relationship you can have with Allah is slave to master relationship. Why then are you quoting the passage to show me that Muhammad is the prophet like Moses when he contradicts the theology of Moses? Now, I, I didn't, it's been only a few minutes, Andrew. I'm just showing how to turn objections against Muslims to bury their arguments and expose Muhammad. With me there? You see it? And then notice it said in Deuteronomy 32, 18, the rock that begat thee gave birth to you. Well, hold on. Chapter 112, verse 3 of the Quran says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Allah neither begets nor is begotten. The God of Moses says, Allah, you're a liar. I do beget. I do produce children. I do give birth to children spiritually, not physically, not sexually. So you're a liar, Allah. 1.12.3 is a lie, Muhammad. Are you catching this? You see what I'm doing? What about Exodus 4, 22 to 23? And then we'll go into the topic. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. No, young Moses, they can't. You're not getting it, young Moses. Listen to me. They can't say that because they're the ones who quoted Deuteronomy. If Deuteronomy is good enough to prove Muhammad, Deuteronomy is good enough to expose Muhammad. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So if they're quoting Deuteronomy, they're stuck with it. That's the point. So stop quoting my Bible then. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith Jehovah, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So folks, you see how easy it is to destroy the Muslim religion and their misuse of the Bible if you learn how to turn the argument against them? Something that I have to say with all honesty without attacking him, James White does not do and I don't think he understands why he needs to do it. I can't say he can't do it. Obviously, our brother is an intelligent man. Why doesn't he use this approach? I don't understand for the life of me why. Right? I don't understand. Why don't you do this? They bring an objection from a biblical passage, respond to it, and then turn it against them. Show that Muhammad is a false prophet. You know, so I don't understand. I really don't. I really don't understand why he doesn't use uh, Zina. You, I'm the last person who'll be able to tutor him because he doesn't. It's hard for him to humble himself to be tutored. Right. But anyway, now let me give you a final example and we'll go to another subject. Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4. You should call him Jehovah. Jehovah is the anglicized pronunciation of the divine name. And 
according to the excellent work of Nehemiah Gordon, Nehemiah Gordon, who's a Karayat, Karayat Jew, he's not a rabbinic Jew, he's actually demonstrated from medieval rabbinic manuscripts. Manuscripts produced by rabbis in a medieval period, showing that the rabbis always knew the pronunciation of the divine name, but they kept it hidden from outsiders. And he shows that in the manuscript, in the tradition of the rabbis, they pronounced the name as Yahovah. Not as Yahweh, but as Yahovah. And because of that, I'm now persuaded to use the word Jehovah. Because that's the anglicized form of the divine name, Yahovah, Yahweh, right? And it's just like saying, should we say Jesus? Why not? Jesus is simply the anglicized form of Isus, which is the Greek equivalent of Yeshua. Anyway, let's read Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. Read with me. Thank you. I'm going to read. I went back. Thank our brother Protestant first and last for serving us for the sake of the Lord. Pay attention to Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. When a man had taken a wife and married her. Pay attention. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give, in to, give it in her hand, and send her out of his, out of his house. Lord, loosen my tongue. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Now pay attention to three and four. Okay, Pay attention to three and four. Okay, And the latter husband hate her. If the latter husband hates her, the second husband ends up hating her. And write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house. Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, her first husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Jehovah. It is an abomination. It's disgusting to God. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which Jehovah thy God giveth thee for inheritance. Now, understand what Jehovah told Moses. If I divorce my wife, she remarries. The second husband divorces her or dies. I can never take her back to be my wife. That is disgusting to God. Did you guys catch that? Did you catch that? Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4. Guys, focus. Don't get into side talks and distract each other. You guys caught it, right? Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4. If my divorced wife marries someone and that person divorces, dies, I cannot take her back as my wife. It's an abomination. What Jehovah says is an abomination, Allah says is the only way to take back your wife. Now, first last, post for us chapter 2, verse 230 of the Quran. Walter, please, no side talks about Moses and the Quran and Muhammad, please. Chapter 2, verse 230 of the Quran, Allah says to Muhammad, the only way a man can take his divorced wife back if she marries someone and he sleeps with her and divorces her. Chapter 2, verse 230 of the Quran. Read it with me. Guys, here you go. So you know I'm not making them up, making it up. Chapter 2, verse 230. And if he hath divorced her the third time, then she is not lawful unto him thereafter until she hath wedded another husband. Then if he, the other husband, divorce her, it is no sin for both of them that they come together if they consider that they're able to observe the limits of Allah. These are the limits of Allah. He manifested them for people of knowledge. Wow. What Jehovah, the true God, says is disgusting and abomination. Allah of Muhammad says that's the only way you can take your wife back. And according to the traditions of Muhammad, it's not enough. It's not enough that the divorced wife marry someone. The Hadith say he has to taste her sweetness. In other words, he has to have sex and enjoy her sexually before he can divorce her and she can return to her husband. Yep, her juice. <laughs> you caught it? Okay, now what's the point? Yep, er Richard, you got it. Now what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? How are you going to quote Deuteronomy 18 to show me that Muhammad is a prophet like Moses when he blatantly contradicts the theology of Moses in that book, the commands of Moses in that book, the moral instructions of Moses in that book, and yet he's the prophet like Moses. Are you serious? 
Are you serious? But now imagine I debated a non Rashid on Muhammad in the Bible. What do you think would have happened to a non Rashid or Ahmad Didad or Shabir Ali or Zakir Naid if I debated them using this approach by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit? Now, to answer Zena's question, that's why they won't debate me. So what do I do? What do I do? I then give you the data, the information in my articles, rebuttals, in these videos. Now you go debate them because the same spirit that fills me fills you. And you can do just as good, if not a better job than me, if you study the material, memorize the material, and share it. Do you see why I'm doing this? God doesn't need me. We need him. And God is using me by the spirit to then equip you. Ask me that question a fourth time, Kak, and I'll bounce you to Mecca. Be patient and sit down and be silent. Do you understand now why? And that was my first professional debate, my first public debate to Jesus. Imagine what I'll do to him now. Okay, You understand now why I am doing these sessions, writing rebuttals, writing articles, and exhorting you, in fact, pleading with you, go to my blog. AnsweringIslamBlog.wordpress.com. I'm putting the links now in the description box. Go there. Go to AnsweringIslam.net. Watch the older videos. Study the material. You, in fact, start a Bible study or an apologetics group. Study the material. Learn it. Absorb it. Where you see a mistake, put it aside. And then go out there and win Muslims and Joe's Witnesses and unbelievers for the glory of Jesus. Do it, please. You with me there? You understand what I'm doing now? So here's how you're going to bless me and respect me and honor me for the sake of Jesus. Number one, obviously pray for me. Number two, partner with me financially if you can, because I'm in full-time ministry. If the Lord wants me to do it, he'll stir up hearts. But beyond that, study these arguments. Memorize these arguments. Apply these arguments in your evangelism, in your witness, in your studies, and pass it on to others. Please. You with me there? Okay. With that said, I'll answer the question of whether Jesus didn't, why didn't Jesus know the day or hour later? But let me answer those two passages that are misused. And again, I want to just uh, give a shout out to a young brother too. Jeremy Jose Veras, he has his own YouTube page that he's building up. He's a young upcoming apologist who loves Jesus. He's a family man that works full time, but still does apologetics on the side. Pray for him, his family. Pray God will keep him in love with Jesus, holy and healthy, provide for him. And pray the Lord continue to encourage him to build up his YouTube page because that's what we want. More YouTube pages, more, more blogs, more websites, more apologists, more evangelists. Okay. Clear? All right. Now, let me come to 1 Timothy. Let's deal with the two passages. Do 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15, and 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, undermine what I said yesterday, that in the Old and New Testaments you find female prophets, female apostles, female rulers, leaders, like Miriam, who ruled Israel under the headship of Moses, or Deborah, who judged Israel and was a prophetess under the headship of Barak, right? Isaiah himself was married to a prophetess, Isaiah 8, 3, right? In the New Testament, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was a prophetess. The four virgin daughters of Philip, they were prophetesses. Do these passages undermine the fact that women can have specific roles in respect to the church, but cannot assume the highest role of bishop slash elder slash, slash overseer? Absolutely not. Are we ready now to unpack it? Yeah, vocab is my homie. We're the A-team. Vocab alone, John, John, what do you mean? David Wood, <clears throat> Adam Coleman, and my myself, we are the Christian apologetic version of the A-team. Pray God will keep us together, bind us together, and seal us together for the glory of Christ. Answering Islam blog .wordpress .com, Magdalene. 
And I, it's in the description box of my other videos, even on Patreon. You can also contribute on PayPal, which is the fastest way. But I'll give you that a little later, right? Okay, Tony, you can come back and watch it. Now, let's now get into 1 Timothy 2. Let's read 1 Timothy 2, verses 8, all the way to 15. Are you ready? It's specifically 2, 9 to 14. Let's read, guys. Here's the passage used to show women cannot have any authority over men in any sense. Let's read and see if this is what Paul is saying. I will therefore that men, 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15, specifically 9 to 14. Read with me. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness, with humbleness. Be modest in your dress. Don't expose too much flesh. And be humble. Don't be arrogant parading your money, your jewelry, right? And sobriety. Not with braided hair. He's not saying braided hair or broided hair. I'm sorry. Braided, broided hair. Or gold or pearls or costly array. He's not saying that's bad. He's saying that's not true adornment. Braiding or broiding your hair, right? Having pearls or gold, that's not true adornment. That is adornment from a worldly perspective. People in the world who are worldly minded look to that and admire that because they want to have that too. And that's why you have so many women out there who are grossly immoral and even filthy and disgusting being loved and celebrated and praised and elevated. And I, for example, like the Kardashians, that's disgusting. It's saying true beauty in the sight of God is not to braid your hair or to have jewelry or expensive rings. True beauty in the sight of God is to dress modestly, not exposing too much flesh and being humble in your demeanor and your apparel. You get it now? But now watch what he says in 10. But which becometh woman professing godly. See, if you are of the world, then dress like a Kardashian or a Larsa Pippin, which I'm ashamed to say, Larsa Pippin, the ex-wife, the soon-to-be ex-wife of Scotty Pippin, is a Syrian. I pray God have mercy on her, convict her to repent, because she's a Syrian. And because of that, I love her and I want her to come to know Jesus. But until she repents, she is disgusting and promoting filth and is a disgrace to her community. May God have mercy on her. And I'm, I know I'm going to get a lot of Syrians upset. Fine, sir. <laughs> I just seem like I'm getting become like James White more and more. All right. Now, here's the key. Women professing godliness. If you're of the world, then be like them. But if you are of Christ and you profess godliness, if you are of Christ and you profess in Jesus' name, bless the connectivity, Lord. Hold on. Okay. If you are of Christ and you profess godliness, then no, that's not how you dress. Perform good deeds and be humble. Now, 11, let's start, guys. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not. I do not permit a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the men. Is he saying she can't teach men in any sense, in any circumstance? Or is it more specific? Nor to usurp authority over the men, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed, first formed, then Eve. And then 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now 15. 15. Let's look at 15. Let's unpack it. Are you ready? 15. Sorry, because lots of... Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in the childbearing if they continue in faith and charity, love, and holiness with sobriety. Being sober-minded, you know, being content, being humble, being modest, not lusting after, you know, riches and jewelry and beauty, right? Physical, that is. Okay, one more time. Let's post... Verses 13 and 14 to see what Paul is not saying. Let's see what Paul is not saying. Okay. Here's how you interpret scripture. Here's how you don't interpret scripture. Don't just quote to me these passages and ignore the examples that Paul is pointing to from the Old Testament and providing an in-depth exegesis of those Old Testament passages to make sense of this particular passage. Notice who he refers to. For Adam was firm, first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Okay. 
by mentioning the story of Adam and Eve, Paul is inviting you to go back and read the Genesis account of creation to see when God created Eve, the first woman, did he subjugate her to Adam in which she had no role of authority whatsoever? She had nothing to contribute, nothing to say. She was simply a silent partner doing what Adam wanted her to do. So are you now ready for an in-depth exegesis of the background of 1 Timothy 2, which is the Old Testament that he appeals to, to show you what Paul did not mean? Are you ready? Are you ready now for the background details that helps us better understand and appreciate what Paul was saying? Okay. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Pay attention now. It may not be exciting to some of you, but it's educational because it's going to teach you how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible. Okay. Genesis 1, 26, 27. Now, guys, pay attention to the language. If you don't, you're not going to catch it. Pay attention to the language. If you don't, you're not going to catch it. And God said, let us make, and the Hebrew word is Adam. Guys, please, everyone, especially the sisters, the ladies, you should want to listen to this, right? Let us make Adam, that's the Hebrew word, in our image, after our likeness. Let them, did you catch it now? Man is now them, more than one. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the foal or fowl of the air and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, Adam in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay. Number one, did you just catch that the Adam that was created in God's image and likeness is male and female? It's more than one. It's the male and the female together. Did you catch it? I can't move on if you don't catch it. Okay. So here's my question. If Paul is appealing to Genesis account of creation, an account he knows and his audience knows shows that the woman was given the right, the power, the authority to rule the entire phys physical creation with the male, how then are you going to tell me that women have no position of authority whatsoever or cannot teach men in any sense, in any circumstance whatsoever? Doesn't that just contradict Genesis 1? You with me there? Pay attention and focus. Doesn't that just contradict just want to say women cannot have any position of authority whatsoever? Are you paying attention, everyone? I don't want to so people don't misuse this passage against me again. Okay. Let's go to Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, just in case you didn't see the fact that Adam there is not just the man, it's the male and female together. Together they are Adam, and together they're created in the image and likeness of God. Genesis 5, verses 1 to 2. Sorry for the resolution. This is the best we can have. Okay, Genesis 5, verses 1 to 2. Hope the sound is good. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, the word is Adam, and the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Did you catch it? Male and female were created and called Adam. Adam is male and female. Male and female together are Adam. And they are the one that God created in his likeness and image and gave them the power to rule physical creation. Right? That's number one. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. 
Exactly, Zina. Zina got the point, Rebecca. You didn't get jewelry or broidered hair. He's not saying you don't wear jewelry. He's saying it's not all about jewelry and broidered hair, right? It's more than that. Anyway, don't get into eye talks, Rebecca. Focus, focus, focus. In Jesus' name, bless this connection, Lord. Please, Lord, and guide me to do justice to this topic. Guide me, Lord. Guide me, guide me. Yeah, I'm sure. See, it's messing up. It's okay. Please, my God. Okay. You with me there? Are you following me now? Okay. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis 2, 18. All right. Sorry, guys. The resolution is not good. As long as my voice is okay. this is, We're going to have to suffer until I get better technology and internet. Okay. Genesis 2, 18. Read with me, guys. And the Lord, Jehovah God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. I will make him a help me for him. Did, did the Bible say I'm going to make a slave for him? It's not good for a man to be alone, so I'm going to make a slave or a helper, someone to assist him, help him, come alongside of him. So the very background of Paul's argument actually confirms Women do share in the authority given to man. Women do have the right to rule over physical creation alongside a man, but they must do so under the authority and headship of that man assigned to her. You, are you catching it now? Now let's see lexically what the word help me means. Okay, are you ready? Let's see lexically, okay? I told you I'm going to have to take some time to unpack this. I was forced to go into this because some guy was pontif pontificating, thinking he knows the scriptures and was going to put me in my place. Boy, that troubles me, man. Okay. Now watch here. Let's look at the word. Let's look at the lexical word. Right here. Here's interlinear for the Hebrew. I'm just going to give it to you. Click there. You can read it. For yourself, excuse me. A helper suitable. Notice a helper suitable. Izir. I can't even read English, let alone uh, uh, Hebrew. Kenigdo. Okay. Let's see what the word suitable is. Suitable. Here you go. Let's see. Suitable. Okay. In front of, inside of, opposite to. Okay. I'm just trying to see the lexical sources according to what is in front of corresponding to. Yeah, that's that's better. Corresponding to. Uh, a suitable helper is a helper corresponding to the man and his role and his needs. But let's see what the word helper means. So just checking it out. I'm, just, I'm doing this on the spot, live. Okay. Okay, live. Vizir. Okay, helper, helpers. Just let's see. Sukur. Yeah, see, uh, old English, Sukur. One who helps, right? Yeah, see, basic. It is a helper, a suitable helper, a helper that is fashioned for the specific role and task assigned to the man, so to enable the man to fulfill that role and that task. You with me there? That's basically it. A helper. Someone to help you, assist you, someone that's capable of helping you. So that person corresponds, right? He's He or she is being fashioned in such a way that they meet the needs of that particular person so that they come alongside and help that person fulfill his responsibilities or her responsibilities. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. You with me there? Okay. Now, let's continue further. Pay attention. Verses 19 to 20. We all do choose Jesus. We all do. Believe me, man, I'm dying for one too. If God gives me the grace to be celibate, I will. But I'll be honest with you, I don't have that gift. And I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. Lord, sooner than later. There's one I can't get out of my mind. Pray about that, guys. All right. Read with me now, everyone. Read, read with me. Genesis 2, 19 to 20. 
And out of the ground, Jehovah God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now pay attention to 20. Pay attention to 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found any helper meet for him. God had Adam name the animals to show Adam's authority over the animals. And as Adam looked, he could not find anyone that was suitable enough to help him in the roles and tasks assigned to him. So obviously the female was not going to be created to be like cattle, completely subjected, subjugated to man. Woman was not created to be a slave of man. You remember that? Don't ask me that question, Mikala Taro, because that's not the topic. Because I know you have some fanatics that say, if your ex-wife has left or your ex-husband has left and committed adultery, that's still not grounds for remarriage. And I say, keep your opinion to yourself because we're not buying it because that's not scriptural. Anyway, coming back to this issue. Are you catching it here? The fact that among the animals, none was found suitable for Adam shows that the woman wasn't created to be a slave because these animals were already subject to Adam, subjugated to Adam at his whim and call, and they would do whatever Adam wanted them to do, and that's all they could do. Obviously, a woman is not going to be like that. I'm going to get to 1 Corinthians in a minute, Isaiah 9, 6. Don't worry about it. Are you with me there? She's going to be a helper who will be designed to be able, a helper comparable, you know, to the man in order to help man discharge his responsibilities. Is that clear so far before I move on to the next point? Adam was one in one sense, A.J. Law, but more than one in another sense because that one Adam is male and female collectively. The two become one flesh. Now let's read 21 to 24. 21 to 24. I'm not trying to bore you, but I'm trying to give you the background information. 21 to 24. Cindy. God will have mercy on you and bless you and restore you and wash you in the blood of Jesus, fill you with the Holy Spirit. Don't lose hope and despair. Keep keep serving Jesus and hopefully God will bless you with the desires of your heart. Genesis 2, 21 to 24, read with me. And Jehovah God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs. Pay attention to that statement, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead, instead thereof, right? And the rib which Jehovah God had taken from man made he a man, a woman, and brought her unto the man. Now notice what Adam says. And Adam said, notice what Adam said. Notice what Adam said. Man, I hope I can get better in that. Okay. All right. The buffering. Sorry. Sorry about that. La, 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 la. Okay. Notice what Adam said. I hope I'm coming in clear. Is it all right now? Verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Basar echad. Now pay attention to this. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she came out of man. No, women cannot be pastors, Malika. Be patient, wait, and listen to yesterday's session. They can assume every role except the role of pastor. Just be patient. Let me get there. Andrew's disagreeing with me, contradicting me. I love you, Andrew, but here we're going to disagree. No, women cannot be pastors. There's no proof of it. They can be deacons, prophets, slash, you know, prophetesses, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. Listen to yesterday's session. Now, coming back to the issue, pay attention. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Andrew, I didn't know. I thought you said yes to her. Pay attention, everyone, pay attention. Yeah, the topic is what roles can women assume and what role, roles women cannot assume. But I went into that 
discussion. No, women cannot be pastors. No, there's no evidence. I'm sorry. They just can't be. Listen to yesterday's session. Focus in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. Focus in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, look what he said. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she came out of man. Now, even the etymology of the term woman, you know what the etymology of the term woman is? Womb of man. The reason why she's called woman, because she came from the womb of man. Now, in the Hebrew, you know what it says in Hebrew? You know what it says in Hebrew? She shall be called Isha because she came out of Ish. The Hebrew word for man here, it's not just Adam. Here it's Ish. She's Isha because she came from Ish. She was a part of me. She came out of me. She's one with me because she has the same flesh I have. She has the same bones I have because she's made from my bones and my flesh. So she has the same essence, nature, dignity, and value. She can't be less in nature than me, inferior in essence, less in value, because she's part of me. She came out of me. So you see now the essential equality of women to man. That's why in Genesis 2.24 it says, when a man cleaves to his wife, they'll become one flesh. Notice, notice, the animals were not compatible with him. So God had to create a woman from man. She comes out of man. She was part of man. She is flesh from the flesh of man. Bones from the bones of man. Therefore, she has the same essence and nature that the man has. How then can she be inferior in essence and nature? You catch it? Is it making sense? So what did you learn thus far from the two chapters? Woman isn't a slave of man. Woman isn't someone that was created simply to just blindly obey and had nothing to share or offer. Woman with the man was given the authority to rule all creation along with the man. And woman comes out of the man because she has the same essence of man, the same nature of man, and therefore she has the same value as man does in the sight of God. Now, here's the other beautiful thing, and someone just alluded to it. The Hebrew word for ribs also means side. Let me show you. The Hebrew word for ribs also means side. Let me show you this. Here it is. Let me give you the link. Watch right here. Let's click on the word for side ribs. Here you go. Here's the lexicon source. So you don't take my word for it. Here you go. Oh, come on. Here you go. Here it goes. What's the word? It means rib or side. Do you see it? So she came from the side of man. One early church father, and I'm going by Mary, so don't quote me. I believe it was Augustine. Maybe not. But it was a church father nonetheless because I've heard it. I haven't confirmed it. But this is what he said. God did not take woman from the heel of man so she wouldn't be beneath him. Nor did God take woman from the crown of man so she wouldn't be over him. God took woman from the side of man so she could come alongside him and join him. Are you with me there? Let me repeat it again. I need you to pay attention. Let me repeat it again. Are you ready? One more time. God did not create woman from the heel of man so she wouldn't be beneath him. God did not create woman from the crown of man, the head of man, so she wouldn't be over him. God created woman from the side of man so she can join him and come alongside of him. Exactly, Andrew. Okay. So if I go back... If I go back, listen now, to the background for what Paul said, 
The first Paul, point Paul is making is this. Not that women have no position or role to play in the church. A woman's role and position in the church has to be under the headship of Adam, meaning man. Why? Because when you go to Genesis, the male was created first, then the female, and she was created to come alongside of him to help him as he leads her. So that's the first thing I see from what Paul is trying to get at. Paul is trying to say that the man has to be the head of the church, and a woman can never take that position from the man as long as she's in submission to that male leadership, and as long as she's obedient to that male leadership, she has a role to play in the church. That's the first point. Exactly. Ribs are near the heart. Okay, you with me there? Did you catch? If I go back to what Paul pointed to, to confirm and justify what he said about woman. Do I get the impression from the context of this background information that Paul appealed to that Paul is saying women have nothing to offer in the church? They can't say anything in the church to men? Is that his point? Are you catching what I'm saying here? But then he says, Adam wasn't deceived. The woman was deceived and fell into transgression. Okay. Now he's talking about Genesis 3. Now let's see what Paul's point is in Genesis 3. Are we ready? Guys, focus. Malik and Zina, you guys are getting to side issues about men issues. This is not a counseling session. I can recommend a local church and some counselors to talk about your men issues. Can we focus? <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. Well, women can't be elders, Irene. Listen to me. Women cannot be elders. They can be deaconesses. They can even be prophetesses. They can even go out and evangelize with men. But I'm agreeing. There is no role of elder for a female. Yeah. Okay, let's pay attention now. The second example Paul appealed to was Genesis 3. The second example Paul appealed to was Genesis 3. Okay. There he says, man wasn't deceived, but the woman was. Yeah. Well, that can be interpreted on many levels. Women can be weaker physically, which is a given. Not all women. General statements do not rule out exceptions to the rule. And they can also be weaker emotionally. But at the same time, they're stronger emotionally because God designed them in such a capacity to be able to bear children and also to care for children and nurture children, something that men would break break down from doing. But anyway, let's pay attention here. Let's go to Genesis 3 and see what Paul's point is. No, it wasn't done on day 7, DMB. Don't let me block you and send you on your merry way. It was done on the sixth day, and he rested on the seventh day. Don't pontificate. Right. Okay, Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7. No, do how there are many Protestants who allow females to be deacons and etc. Guys, don't ask me side questions that have nothing to do with exegesis. You see what's going on here? Now, do how Protestants are wrong. Well, men treat men, you know, women badly. Woo uh, can you guys? What's that one? Why can't you focus? My goodness, man. Protestants are wrong now, Sam. Okay, how does that relate to my discussion? Boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. What's wrong with you guys, man? Darn it. And then the other people listen, get upset at me. Sam, please, we love the sessions, but when you go off on tangents because you get distracted, it kills us. Tell me about it. They're killing me. All right. What is this? Do it again. Sorry, Protestant. Post it again. Next, we're going to talk about, well, you say, I just poured out so much love into my man's life, and he just sits there like a couch potato. Sam, how does that tie in with Genesis 3? Huh? 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 All right. Genesis 3. Let's read. Okay, let's read now. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7. Read with me. <laughs> now, the serpent was more subtle 
than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now here is where you're going to see the beauty of the King James. Okay. Hold on, Protestant. Sorry, man. I'm making you work very hard for the money I don't give you. I'm making you work very hard for the money I don't give you. Your reward is with the Lord. One second. Let's try this again. Here's something beautiful about the King James that you don't catch in modern versions. Okay. Put verse 1 into one more time. We're going to go verse by verse. Verses 1 and 2, one more time. Genesis 3, 1 and 2. Here's the advantage of the King James. Guys, here's one I want you to pay attention as he posts it. Anytime you see in the King James, thee, thy, thine, thou, that's singular. It's referring to one. Anytime you see in the King James, ye, right, you, your, it's plural, right, two or more. Okay, now with that said, go back and read verses 1 and 2 again. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said unto the woman, although he's speaking to the woman, notice the pronouns. Yea, hath God said, ye, he didn't say thee, ye, that's more than one, shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now notice what the woman said. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruits of the tree of the garden. Now let's put three and four. Slowly. Slowly. Three and four. Pay attention. Read again. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye, she's quoting God as saying ye, that's two or more. He didn't say thee, thou, ye in, uh, in old English means two or more. Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now watch what the serpent says in verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Ye means, the serpent is not just talking to Eve. Ye means, Adam and Eve are there together. And the serpent is listening. I'm sorry, and the serpent is speaking, and Adam is hearing the conversation between Eve and the serpent and he's saying nothing. He's remaining silent. Are you with me there? Eve and Adam are both listening. But what's happening is he's speaking to the woman. And Adam is right there. And he's addressing them both. But he's addressing her. And Adam's listening. So he's saying, Eve. You guys ain't going to die, but he's not talking at him. He's talking to the woman. You guys are not going to die. Now let's read five to seven. No, no, watch, Vine, watch. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes, both your eyes. So now this is what's happening. The serpent's looking at Eve. He's saying, God knows. Neither are going to die, but both your eyes are going to open. So as he's talking to Eve, he's also addressing Adam, and Adam is hearing this. He's hearing this. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and all right, sorry, the buffering, this is what we got to do. It was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were na naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now post six one more time. Post six one more time. Nathan, you're getting it. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband who was with her. Do you see? The Hebrew is clear and the King James captures it perfectly. When, Loris, please, no distractions. Stop, please. Guys, pay, pay attention, please. When the serpent was speaking to the woman, the Hebrew is clear, and the King James makes it clear that he was talking about them both. So 
imagine, God forbid, I'm the serpent and Eve is right here and Adam's right here. So I say, did God really say to both of you that a day that you guys eat, you will die? So Adam is there listening to the woman and the serpent engaging. Are you with me there? Nada got it. Now you understand Paul's point. What is Paul's point? Adam failed in that he let the woman take authority and converse with the serpent when it was his role to step in and stop her and correct her and rebuke the serpent. And he didn't, and therefore the disastrous consequences. That's the point of Paul and 1 Timothy 2. Are you with me there now? You understand what his point is? If I unpack Genesis 1, 2, and 3 from what Paul is calling, he's calling from those chapters to explain women and their role in the church. The last thing Paul is doing, if you understand the background of his argument, Adam and Eve, is that women can't teach men in a church, don't have any role in the church. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. You know what he's saying here? Women cannot be given of the position of authority over a mixed congregation where they are the leaders. That they cannot do because we see that when Eve was created, she was created to help Adam. He was the leader. And we saw what happened when she then usurped his position of authority and took over the conversation instead of stepping back and telling Adam, you step in and you address the serpent. That's your role. You in there? Do you understand what the point is? Eve usurped the authority of Adam, which wasn't for hers to have. What she should have done as an obedient woman, as a helper, Adam, you step in. Why is he speaking to me? You are the one that leads. I'm here to assist you. You address him. You tell him and put him in his place. But what did Adam do? He stepped back and allowed the serpent to tempt his wife and did nothing to protect her and guard her. He's exactly jumping like a monkey. Yep. Had Adam done what he was supposed to, he would have stepped in and said, hey, that's my wife. If you want to ask anyone or talk to anyone, you talk to me. And yes, God did say that. Get away from us. Are you catching now or no? Did you catch it? Yes, Snake did an absolute wonderful strategy, Tony. But now let me unpack why Eve was deceived. Can I tell you why Eve was deceived? Because she was deceived, not Adam. Exactly, Lisa. Men, be men and lead. Yep. Now let me unpack and explain why she was deceived. The implication of Genesis 3 is that God left the responsibility of instructing Eve what she could and couldn't do in the garden to Adam. In other words, what the implication of Genesis 3 happens to be is that God, after creating Eve, never told Eve, you can eat of all the trees except this one because he left that for Adam to do. You get the point? Now here's your bride, Adam. Enjoy each other. Love each other. Get to know each other. Now run my garden and rule the world. And I'll be showing up here and there to have fellowship with you. But now I'm going to give you your private time. See, even God gives couples their private time. You with me there? Are you listening to this? I want to make sure it's sinking in. So that means Adam would have said, you know, Eve, you see all this garden here? All these trees are ours, but that tree we can't eat. Why, Adam? Because God told me that this is something he doesn't want us to touch, but to trust him. Instead of learning knowledge on our own, we will allow him to instruct us about what is right or wrong, and we'll trust him. Okay, so the serpent realized, since God never told Eve directly, 
he would have a greater shot of getting her to doubt what God said because she didn't hear it from the source. She heard it through the instrumental agent. She heard it from a secondary source, a second person, which means that the serpent's sin wasn't just getting Eve to doubt God, but getting to question even Adam's integrity, Adam's authority, Adam's honesty. Because in eating of the fruit, that means she doubted whether what her husband told her was right. So he already started a friction between husband and wife. Do you see how smart the devil is? Exactly, Nada. Do you see how smart he is? And notice, again, let me now bring it back to the 21st century. Listen to me. Adam... And Eve were getting to know each other. And the serpent realized, I need to destroy their relationship in order to destroy the world. And Satan has been doing it ever since. One of the main jobs of the devil is to destroy homes that have children. Because if you destroy the relationship between the husband and wife, then you destroy the mental, spiritual, and physical health of the children, producing misfits who grow up to become misfits and who destroy society. And Satan knew that from day one. And he's doing an absolute marvelous job. Because like Adam and Eve, we listen to his whisperings and suggestions and say we don't care what God says about marriage. We don't care God, what God says about the woman reverencing the husband. We don't care about what God says about husbands loving your wives. Because why? God wants godly offspring, and divorce destroys godly offspring, and that's why I hate divorce. You catching it now? Let me show you one of the reasons why God hates divorce. No, Serge, I'll give you $20 million if you show me. It's what God told her directly. Either you're ignorant or you're lying. You can say God said this to me without the fact that it's God saying it to you, but the Bible saying it to you. And because you believe the Bible is the word of God, you can say God told me not to have sex before marriage. Or you can say Jesus told me I can't leave my wife, even though you're quoting Paul who said it, because Paul is the mouthpiece of Christ. So, Serge, either you're an ignoramus or you're, again, you're a liar. Don't challenge me. Okay. Malachi chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. Here's one of the reasons why God hates divorce. Here, one of the reasons. Pay attention, folks. It's from 13 to 16. We're going to read at 12. Pay attention. Why God wasn't blessing the Israelites and their sacrifices. Pay attention. Jehovah will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto Jehovah of hosts. Pay attention here. I need you to listen to this, especially you who are married. And this is this have ye done again, covering the altar of Jehovah with tears and weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not, regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Now let me explain what he's saying here. Even though we come before God and the altars and give sacrifices, he doesn't accept anything from us. He doesn't accept our sacrifices. Why? God, why don't you accept our sacrifices? And why don't you hear our prayers? Brother, I got so much grace. I'm going to bless you with so much grace. I'm going to lay hands on you and grace you because of your arrogance and attention and whining. Now read 14 to 16. Read with me. What say ye wherefore? Why are you saying why God doesn't accept our sacrifices? Pay attention, because Jehovah hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. God is a witness against how you've been treating the woman that you married when you were young. The woman, the wife of your youth. And I'll break that down in a minute. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Now notice what God says in verse 15, 16. Pay attention. And did not he make one? Did he not make you one with her? The wife of your covenant, your companion, 
The woman you married when you were young, yet had he the residue of the spirit, the remnant of the spirit, the result, the fruit of that union. Wherefore one? Why did he make you one? That he might seek godly seed. I made you one because I wanted you to produce for me children who would love me. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Now notice verse 16. For Jehovah, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. That's divorce. That's the old English way of saying he hates divorce. For one covereth violence with the, his garment. His garment is a uh, biblical idiom meaning your wife because you cover your wife with your garment. And that's what we call a euphemism for having sex. Okay? So it's saying you have done violence to your wife, the one that you have covered with your garment, brought in your bed, under your sheets, the one you've slept with to be your wife. You've done violence against her, saith Jehovah. Right? Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Okay, now let's break it down. Okay, you ready? Let's break it down. Number one, the reason why God says to this man, you have dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth because in biblical times, when a woman and a man had reached an age past puberty, they were considered physically and mentally mature to get mentally mature. I want to say it again, not immature. Mentally mature to get married. So people back then got married, 14, 15, 16, 8, 17, 18. But because in biblical times, pay attention now, God allowed men to have multiple wives at times as his first wife got older and was less attractive. The man would start ignoring her more and more and even despising her because he had other wives that he was attracted to and satisfied him. You see what God is doing here? He's actually going to bat for the wife that's gotten old and is not as attractive as the other wives. You see what God is doing? Send Serge on his merry way because this dog keeps barking because he's rabied. He's foaming at the mouth. Yeah. You, see, you see what God is doing? Look at the love that God has for women. He's saying, because of your wife, the wife of your youth, you have dealt treacherously with her. I will not accept your prayers. I will not accept your sacrifices. You disgust me until you make it right and love her again. You got that? Was that clear? But then he says, the reason why he wanted you to get married in the first place is because he wants godly offspring, godly seed. And that's why I hate divorce. What's the implication? Guys, see the meat here by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's dig in. Meat. Here's what he's saying. I hate when you put up, put away your wife because that then destroys the offspring that I wanted from you, whom I wanted to be godly and whom I wanted you to raise in the fear and love of God. I hate divorce basically because of what it does to these children. Making sense? You see what's happening here? That's Malachi 2, 12 to 16. Okay. So Satan knows from the garden, if I can mess up marital relationships, I can mess up children, and then they grow up to become misfits who destroy society. So that's why, guys, look around you. Satan is smarter than you can imagine. But if you have the wisdom of God, then you'll know his tricks and know how to defeat him. Why do you think there's such a big attack on traditional marriage? You just heard recently about the father who's fighting to stop the mother of his son from changing the gender of his son, turning his son into a woman. And the courts actually agreed with the mother, went on the side of the mother, and gave her the authority and the right to change the gender of his son. And he's devastated. Yeah, you didn't hear it? It's all over the news. 
I know Charles Dickens because the court destroyed me because of my adulterous ex-wife. May God have mercy. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus Christ. So now they reverse the decision. Praise God. God turned the hearts of the judges towards this man to preserve the gender of his son because you made him male and no one can undo what you've done in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Good news. Update. But even the fact that they would initially side with her. But glory to God. The hearts of the kings and the judges are in his hands. Turn them towards your will, Father, to have mercy upon us, your people. For the sake of your son, the Lord Jesus, and seal us by your spirit. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. You got me excited. Praise God. But what's the point? This assault and attack on marital, this assault and attack on marital relationships started where and when? This assault and attack on Marital relationships started where and when? In the garden. And how? He went to the woman. The man is standing there. He lets the woman and the serpent engage. When instead he was supposed to step in as their guardian saying, Hey, wait. Don't you dare talk to my wife. You want to talk to anyone? You talk to me. And yet God did say that. And you're a liar. Get out of here. Or at the very least, the woman should have said, you know what? That's for my husband. That's his role. Honey, you deal with him. You address him. So what happened was there was a role reversal. Role reversal. The woman usurped the authority of the man, and the man stood back and allowed her to do so. And then because he was infatuated with her and her beauty and loved her more than even God, he went ahead and allowed her to eat of the forbidden fruit and partook of it, which then resulted in God saying the following. Genesis 3, 17. Genesis 3, 17. Genesis 3, 17. Watch here. Yep. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying. So you see what his sin was? You listened to your wife and you ate of the tree. You listened to her. Instead of stopping her, instead of correcting her, instead of protecting her, you went ahead and obeyed her over against me. And now this is the consequences. Okay, now let's let's recap and sum up. Let me sum up what the point is. Paul, in order to make his argument about women not usurping authority over men or teaching men, points to Adam and Eve, their story. Okay? Yes, that would have been the form of idolatry, Jason. But now pay attention. We just unpacked the story of Adam and Eve. Is there anything in the Genesis account to show that when God created the female, she had no role to play? She had no authority. All she was was a slave, completely subject to whatever Adam said. Or do we find the following? Eve, along with Adam, was created in the image of likeness of God. Eve, along with Adam, was named Adam to show <clears throat> their common essence, their union, their unity and essence and value and dignity. Eve, along with Adam, was given the same right to rule all physical creation. Eve came out of Adam to show us and to show Adam and to show Eve she has the same value, dignity in the sight of God because she has the same essence and nature that Adam has because she's bone, bones of his bones, flesh of his flesh, right? And that Eve was created to be a helper suitable to assist Adam in discharging his responsibilities. Is that what we saw? Yep, mommy girl, that's what happened. Is that what we saw? Pastino, you know I'm going to send you back to Italy. You keep acting stupid, right? And so what was the problem in Genesis 3? 
The problem with Genesis 3 is Eve usurped the authority of Adam, allowed the serpent to engage her, and then she was the first to reach out and took the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam. And Adam stood there as a passive passerby, did nothing to correct her, did nothing to stop her, did nothing to protect her, did nothing to silence the serpent, failing in his responsibility to lead her. He let her lead him. Is it making sense now? Exactly, Marcel. Now you see how much at fault Adam was, right? At All this time, we kept blaming Eve. But in reality, Adam needs to be rebuked. Because Adam, where were you to protect your wife? Adam, where were you to stop the serpent from engaging her? Adam, why didn't you intervene? And now with all this hindsight, and by the way, if you want further proof, Paul is appealing to Genesis chapters 1 to 3. Let's read Genesis 3, 16. Jeremy, where you been for the past 40 minutes, bro? I just spent several minutes unpacking. He was there alongside her and that the serpent was addressing them both. Where'd you go, bro? You missed all that? Okay, Genesis 3.16, pay attention here. Okay, that, yeah, it's all there, bro. Go back and listen to it. I went through all of that in depth, proving he was there and explaining what the mistake was. Genesis 3.16, guys, read. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, remember, it's talking about the woman giving birth in labor pains, to a greater degree of an intensity of pain and misery. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy 2.15. Pay attention, folks. 1 Timothy 2.15. 1 Timothy 2.15. Watch here. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Hmm. Do you see the connection with Genesis 3? The woman will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Lord willing, I promise to do a future session unpacking this verse. I won't unpack it now. I will in the future, God willing. But did you see the allusion to Genesis 3.16 again? The allusion? So you understand the entire section of 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15 is building off of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. With that said, let's reread 1 Timothy 2, verses 9, all the way to 13. Now let's reread it. Let's see if now we can understand. In the manner also, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now let's see if we understand them. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was the first form, then Eve. Now, in light of the background, was Paul saying a woman has to be completely silent like Eve was? has no role to play in the church, can't teach in any sense, in any context, period, end of story, or he's saying something else. I do not want women to have authority over men, to teach men in the sense of that she is the leader, leading men, and men are in subjection to her. That's not going to happen, right? So I don't want her to be in rebellion. Rebellious about this <clears throat> position that she's not going to assume the leadership role and and guide men and lead men that's not for her and when he says silence it means be quiet about it don't be troublesome about it don't argue about it don't fight me on this agree with me this is what god wants what is the point of paul's teaching in context
What is the point? Not that you can't teach or you can have some sense of authority. It means you cannot be the one teaching in this respect where you are guiding the men, leading the men, and the men are in submission to you. And you're not going to assume authority over the male leadership and be quiet about it, be humble about it, accept it, don't be a troublemaker and argue and bring division. Because this is how it's got to be. This is how God designed it. It's talking about the affairs of the church, Pastino. Is that clear? To further prove to you, to further prove to you, that's Paul's meaning. Everyone getting it so far? To further prove to you, that's Paul's meaning, that women can teach. And they can even teach in the congregation with men present. Go to Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. Titus 2, 3, 3 to 5. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, the older woman, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. Hmm. That they may teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers out of their home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So wait, Paul. So you're saying women can teach in some sense. They teach good things to the younger woman. Oh, so they can teach. But someone say, oh, yeah, they can teach other women, but not men. But at least you're conceding the fact, Paul is saying, they can teach in some sense. Are you catching it? Yep, thank you, Jethro Thing. Yes, I pray God stirs up your heart. Are you catching it now, women? That's why the same men who say women can't teach, they say, no, no, they can teach younger women. But I thought you're taking Paul. I mean, they can't teach in any sense. So you just agree that's not Paul's meaning because the same Paul wrote to Titus, older women can teach good things, especially to younger women. Good. So you're now making a qualification. But now let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and 5. Thank you, brethren. That would really bless me to do full-time ministry. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4, 4 to 5. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now notice 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is an evil, even that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now catch what Paul said. Now let me ask you a question. Do men pray and prophesy in the church? Do men pray? And prophesying doesn't mean predicting the future. Prophesying means proclaiming the word of God, preaching the word of God. Men do pray and prophesy in the church. But then notice it says the women do also, but he's telling them how to do it and how not to do it. Men, when you pray and prophesy in the church, don't have your head covered. Women, when you pray and prophesy, had your head covered. But wait, Paul, I thought women can't teach or prophesy when there are men present. Do you catch it? So here's more proof that Paul is not saying that. Paul is saying in the church, both men and women are praying and prophesying, but the men can't be covered. The women have to. And if they do, let them keep praying and prophesying. Right? Now read. let's read 6 to 9. Again, Paul is going to appeal to Genesis. 6 to 9. Again, he's going to appeal to Genesis. 1 Corinthians 11, 6 to 9. I'm going to have to do a part two. Amen, Rachel. To God be the glory. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Okay, if she's not going to cover her head, shave her head. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. See, at that time at Corinth, women who shaved their heads were known as prostitutes, as whores. It was something shameful. 
showing they were in rebellion and they were prostitutes. So obviously a decent God-fearing woman is not going to shave her head. Well, if you're not going to shave your head, cover it. We'll get to that, Mikala. Don't worry about whether the long hair is. Just pay attention to the point. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head because he reflects the glory of God. For as much as he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. The man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. See, he's talking about Genesis. The woman came from the man. Eve came from Adam. Adam didn't come out of Eve. And she came out of Adam to, uh, Adam to assist Adam, not the other way around. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. That's an allusion to Genesis again. I'll explain the head covering. Just be patient and focus. Okay. Now, you understand what Paul just did? Woman came out of man. Man didn't come out of woman. Adam did not come out of Eve. Eve came out of him, right? And Eve was made for Adam. Therefore, she has to honor her head. And since God created Adam, he has to honor God. But let me show you something deep that you guys will miss. 1 Corinthians eleven seven. I like that name. I don't know if it's female or male. Mikaela. Mika. Okay, whatever. Mikaela. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, 7 again. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. A lot of people misread this to say, you see, Paul thinks men are better than women. Women are inferior. Because he says man is the image and glory of God, whereas the woman is the glory of the man. This again shows their ignoramuses for two reasons. Number one, Paul is referring to Genesis 1 again, right? Wait, Genesis 1 says the man and the woman together are created in the image and likeness of God. So Paul can't be contradicting the very Old Testament he's citing. Number two, a little logic, folks. If the woman is the glory of man and man is the glory of God, that means by extension she has to be the glory of God because man's glory is God's glory. So if the woman is the glory of the man and the man is the glory of God, by extension, the woman is the glory of God. Hello? You got it? You got it? Okay. Once again, is man the glory of God? Yeah. So the glory as is God's glory? Yes. So it's not his glory. No. So if the woman is the glory of man... But man's glory belongs to God. Aren't you now saying by extension the woman is the glory of God? Yes. So what's the problem? But wait. Let's go to verse 10. And I'm going to show you what Paul's going to do in a minute. Let's go to verse 10. I'm going to show you what Paul's going to do in a minute. But let's read verse 10 first. Don't ask me to unpack this today. I promise you, God willing, I'll unpack 1 Corinthians 11.10 and 1 Timothy 2.15 in a future session. Don't ask me about it, please, and focus. Exactly, El Darius, they don't. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angel. So one thing I want you to learn. Paul is saying men and women are prophesying and praying in the church, and he has no problem with it as long as they follow proper decorum. Women, you pray and prophesy, but make sure you have a covering. Men, you pray and prophesy, make sure you don't have a covering. So as long as you do what I'm telling you, you can pray and prophesy. But hold on, Paul. I thought in 1 Timothy 2 you said women can't teach. Well, if they're prophesying, prophesying is proclaiming the word. Doesn't that mean they're teaching in a mixed congregation? Yeah. So are you contradicting yourself? No, because you're stupid. You don't know what I mean in 1 Timothy 2. Oh, okay, Paul. But that's what they tell me you mean. Don't listen to just anybody. You see the point? Right? Okay, but now Paul is going to finish his argument. Guys, this is why you got to read in context. What he said in verses 6 to 10 is part of the story. Now he's going to give you the other half. He's now going to finish the point. Here's where you got to read Paul in context. Yes, woman was made for man. Yes, woman came out of man. Yes, woman has to have a covering over her head. However, let me finish it. Let me complete the picture. Now let's get the complete picture. Let's read 11 and 12. 11 and 12. Read, guys, the picture. 
Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. See, that nevertheless means, hold on, it's not the end of the story. Nevertheless, even though I said this, let me finish the picture. Man is without the woman either. You, you can't have a man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Yes, it's true. Eve came out of Adam, but now every man has to come out of a woman to show man cannot live without woman like woman cannot live without man. And God did this to show you need each other. You are interdependent and depend on God. You see how he's completing the picture now? Do you see how he's completing the picture? This is what happens with you guys if you don't read context. If you stop at one part of the text, you're going to misunderstand what God is saying. Finish the context. Yes, woman came out of man. She was made for man. She's a great man. However, nevertheless, man is also for woman and came out of woman and needs the woman because without the woman, none of us would be born. So what is the covering, Paul? Because you said the woman has to be covered. Well, let me tell you what her covering is. 13 to 16. Let's finish it. Thirteen and six. Judge in yourselves. Is it is it calmly that a woman? All right. All right. Sorry about that. I'm buffering again. Judge in yourselves. Is it calmly? Is it right? Is it befitting? Is it honorable that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not nature, even nature itself, teach you that if a man have long hair and he's talking about real long hair, like the hippies used to, it is a shame unto him. It's embarrassing. I remember times in the late 70s, early 80s, I'd see someone from the back with long hair, and I'd look, and the, and the person had a beard because it was a dude. It was a guy. Right? Right? But now watch here. Now watch here. Verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Bam! Thank you, ma'am. End of story. He finished it. He just explained. Yes! A woman has to have the sign of authority over her head. She has to have a covering. But that's why God gave her long hair. Her long hair is her covering. End of story if you let Paul finish his point. If you stop at 10, you're getting the incomplete picture. 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, if you want to argue with me, and I know some people are going to argue me after this, attack me in the comment section. No, brother, you misquoted. It has to be a, a veil. Don't argue with me. You, you don't agree with me. Keep it to yourself. Don't argue with me. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, we don't have any other custom. So let me finish the story. Woman has to be covered when she prays and prophesies. Woman came out of man for the glory of man. However, now men come out of woman and men need woman because together they all depend on God. And yes, a woman has to be covered, but that's why she has long hair. Right? But what does this mean if a woman has short hair or has thinning hair that's not long? That's when you put a veil. You with me there? Let me repeat again. If you happen to be a woman with short hair or thinning hair, balding hair, that's when you put a veil. But if you have long flowing hair, that's your veil, according to Paul. And all churches agreed with him. Exactly, Irene. But now that she became a Muslim, Irene, she's covered. But now my point, whatever, follow with me. Yes, a wig will work. I mean, whatever is, you know. Now, follow with me. Follow with me. How can Paul mean in 1 Timothy 2 that a woman can't teach in a mixed congregation when in 1 Corinthians 11, he's telling us, Women were prophesying along with men who are prophesying. And prophesying is proclaiming God's word. And that's teaching. Is Paul contradicting himself? Is Paul contradicting himself? Lord willing, if I have tom time tomorrow, 
I'm going to do part two because I have to cover 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. So you can thank the Lord for that snotty, know-it-all Christian who left that comment, challenging me on 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. Had it not been for him, I wouldn't have done this in-depth session. And I pray this session blessed you, challenged you, and blew your mind away at how much meat and depth there is in the scripture, how beautiful the scripture is, and how much God loves the woman. He loves the woman just as much as the man. You with me there? So now let me end it with the icing on the cake. Icing on the cake. And God willing, I'm going to do part two on 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35. In fact, I forgot this. If you want further proof that women can teach, pray, and prophesy even in mixed congregations, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11. I forgot this. And then we're going to end it with Genesis 3, 16. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11. Pay attention now. Tell me if these gifts are only for males. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Man here is inclusive, meaning everyone. It's not gender specific. Pay attention. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues, meaning speaking in different languages. To another, the interpretation of those languages. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay. Question. These gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the body of Christ, he only gives it to, to men, not to women? Or does he give it to both men and women? And according to 1 Corinthians 12, the reason why these gifts are given to both men and women so that they can use these gifts to build up their fellow Christians and build up the churches. If you tell me both, then how are you going to tell me women have nothing to offer, no role to play in the church when it comes to even teaching or praying? How? Irene, since you have the discerning spirit, honestly, what do you discern about me? Because I'll receive it. Okay? How? Yes. In Greek, the word man, it's just like today when we say, you know, all of man is corrupt. We're talking about everyone. It's inclusive. Okay, Zena, I'm scared because you're Chaldean. Okay. Now, finally, icing on the cake. You're going to live it. You're going to love it. Live it. You're going to love it, women. Women, you're going to love it. Genesis 3.16. Exactly, Sylvia. God loves women, honors women, and exalts them to the proper position. Did you know, folks, can I say this? If women did their part and obeyed Jesus, and men did their part and obeyed Jesus, marriage would be a piece of heaven on earth. But let's read Genesis 3.16. Guys, remember, this is judgment. The Lord now is going to punish Eve for her rebellion. Rebellion. God is now going to punish Eve for her rebellion. Notice the judgment. Notice the judgment. Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. When you conceive, I'm going to make it even more painful than it already would have been. I'm going to make your labor pains much more intense than it already would have been. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. Now, this part is where you're going to get blown away. Some of you already know this because we went over this. And your own experience proves this to be true if you've been in the world. Watch here. This part. Let's break it down. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. Now, folks. Yep. Let me repeat again because you need to listen to yesterday's session, Ross Scott. Women can't be bishops slash elders slash overseers slash pastors, but they can assume any and every role under the authority of a male bishop. But now watch here. Let's break down this last part, folks. This is where you're going to get blown away. You ready? 
Pay attention now. And here's part of your punishment, Eve. Here's part of your punishment. You will desire your husband and he'll rule over you. Now you think, wait, wait, wait. That's that's something good, right? That's something good, right? Don't you want your wife to desire you? No, not in this context. In this context, husbands, men, you don't want this kind of desire. Do you know why? Are you listening? Why? This is not a blessing. God is punishing them. If my, my wife desires me, meaning she finds me attractive, loves me, that's good. But that's not the point here. He's saying, here's the punishment upon you and future relationships. You're going to desire your husband. He'll rule over you. People don't know these same two words, desire and rule, are used in the very next chapter. Genesis 4, verse 7. Genesis 4, verse 7. Now here, Irene, get blown away. Genesis 4, verse 7. Look what God says to Cain. God speaking to Cain who's angry. Pay attention. God speaks to Cain who's angry. Exactly virtual warfare. Exactly Heather. Now pay attention for the proof. If thou doest well. Cain, if you do well, shalt thou not be accepted? Now pay attention to this. And if thou doest not well. If you don't do well. Sin lieth at the door. See, he's describing sin like a demon crawling. And unto thee shall be his desire. Same word. And thou shalt rule over him. Same word. Cain, be careful. Sin desires you. You must rule over it. Is this good? Or is this bad? Sin desires to control you, Cain, to destroy you. But you must conquer it. You must vanquish it. You must subjugate it. That's what God is saying about male and female relationships. Now a woman fallen will desire to control a man, to ensnare a man, to destroy a man. And as long as she can't control him, she's going to constantly desire him. And a man is going to vanquish her, conquer her, like a king conquers another king and makes him eat the dust of the ground. It means relationships are going to be bad. And now let me prove to you how your experiences and mine and the world prove the Bible is absolutely 100% right because it is the word of God and God is real and he knows man better than we do. Doesn't this explain why when you have a guy who treats a woman like a queen, she walks all over him, treats him like dirt. And doesn't this explain that as long as a man mistreats a woman, abuses her, she chases over him. She just <clears throat> swoons all over him and can't stop loving him because that's the punishment. That's the punishment. Pay attention. Those of you in the world, pay attention. Notice the women who are madly in love with dirt bags, who abuse them, mistreat them, treat them like dogs, and they want them more and more because that's that desire. She's going to constantly desire him until she ensnares him. The moment he gives in, she'll be turned off by him and moved on to another victim. Notice the guys who are good to the woman. The woman walk all over them, treat them like dirt, and leave them for a bad boy. Right, Al? You and me both, brother, because we are not in the faith all, all our life. But this is the beauty of Jesus. You know what Jesus says? In me, you're forgiven. In me, you are transformed. In me, you are now restored. Women, no more desiring to control your husbands. Husbands, no more vanquishing your women and treating them like a doormat. You will now treat them the way I wanted Adam to treat Eve. And Eve, you will treat Adam the way, I'm sorry, woman, I will, you'll treat your husband the way I wanted Eve to treat Adam. That's what I've come to do restore those relationships before Satan came in and destroyed it. That's what I've come to do. Restore, rebuild marriages and family. Sunk in? Made sense? Well, the grace of God can even pour out unto unbelievers as a sign of goodness to unbelievers too, Jason. 
But what incentive would unbelievers have to want to do what Christ wants them to do in a marriage? They don't care. You with me there, Jason? But you will find even unbelieving folks, unbelievers, that have beautiful marriages because that's the grace of God, Jason. That's what Jesus calls God showing love and kindness even to evildoers and the righteous alike. Showing kindness and love to all creatures, evil and righteous alike, because he's going to use that against evildoers on the day of judgment saying, look, all these graces, all these blessings, all this love for me, and you still could care less about me. Zina, you just confirmed what I just said. So don't ex don't assume this means every marriage everywhere or only Christians benefit. In fact, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Only Christian benefit. I know Christians who are married and are miserable and are living in hell because one spouse is failing to honor the other. One spouse is failing to obey Jesus and being Christ to the other. In fact, I'm an example. Here, you know my story. Married 10 years, verbal, physical abuse. I'm not trying to play victim here. And my marriage ended in disaster, in hell, and we're all suffering, even my ex and my children. And I know other Christians as well. Mecca, you can only stay on this channel if you're not going to attack, you're not going to mock, you're not going to blaspheme, and just listen. You're more than welcome. Okay, let me now end it with an exhortation to men and women. Let's look at Ephesians 5.21 real quickly, and I got to go. Ephesians 5.21. Ephesians 5.21. Yep, Andrew is my guy. Though he's an atheist, he does love Jesus in his heart, and he's going to be worshiping Jesus and preaching sooner than later. Watch. But I do love this guy. Now read Ephesians 5.21. I want you to pay attention to this word fear. Pay attention. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I want you to pay attention to that word fear. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Because now I want you to read Ephesians 5.33. Thank you, Lion Bar. Ephesians 5.33. Watch here. Ephesians 5.33. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, Ryoku. This is it, last point. Pay attention here. Nevertheless, talking about husbands and wives, how to treat each other like Christ treats the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Now watch here. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Mickey, you need to leave now. Send sushi on his merry way. Reverence her husband. Did you know the word reverence is the same Greek word as fear in Ephesians 5.21? Listen now, when Paul says, fear God, and he says, woman, reverence your husbands, it's the same word. Paul is telling wives, revere your husbands like you revere God. Did you catch it? And this is even something confirmed by studies, marital studies, studies about why marriages fail or succeed even by secular so-called experts. You know what they confirm? So-called marriage counselors and experts, even secular ones who don't follow the Bible. You know what they say? Guys, you know what they say? You know what they say? They go, husbands complain that their wives don't respect them, and marriages fail because husbands feel the wives don't respect them, and wives complain because they feel the husbands don't love them, and they end the marriage because they don't feel loved by their husbands. You know what's amazing about that? You want to be blown away? Did you know there's not a single command in the New Testament where Paul or the apostles tell wives, love your husbands? They tell the wives, honor and revere your husbands. And did you know that whenever husbands are exhorted, they're told to love their wives? Husbands, love your wives because that's their need. Wives, honor, revere your husbands because that's their need. Wow, you tell me this book is not supernatural. Because even modern studies, don't take my word for it, even modern studies by secular so-called experts say, 
Husbands feel that their wives don't respect them and honor them, and that's why marriages end. They feel disrespected, and all they want is to be respected. And wives say they want to be loved and feel loved by their husbands, and they don't get it. And here you have in the Word of God, the Word of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Word of the triune God, the true God who lives, Jesus who's alive, and this book that he produced to show us the way of happiness, to save us from Satan and destroying our families and children. And already in that book, you know what it says? Husbands, love your wives because I designed them to be loved by you. Wives, honor your husbands because I designed them to be honored by you. If you do what I say, your marriage will be a taste of heaven. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. And I, and I know you'll come in agreement when I do this. I'm going to do this on behalf of you. We love you, Father. I do this on behalf of my brothers and sisters listening. We love you, Lord Jesus. We adore you. Cover us by your blood. Cover my daughters by your blood, Lord Jesus. Heal them and save them from this marital destruction. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill us for Jesus and seal us for Jesus and save us from Satan, from the world and our own flesh. And help us to know the word and live it by your power. And save our loved ones. Save my children and provide for us. Provide for me and plant me here to be used by your power to glorify Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow, God willing, for part two. Hit the like button. Re-listen to this. Pass it on to others. Love you. Christ loves you more.